Good morning. Hope you're all well this morning and enjoying a beautiful day as God has provided and another opportunity for us to come together and open God's word and look to him and uh, seek his voice in our lives. Um, we're going to give thanks and uh, enjoy. I hope you've had a full and rewarding week. I have spent most of the week underneath a large machine trying to fix it. And as we're going to continue our discussion of faith this week, uh, we had a week filled uh, with opportunities to have faith. I had a machine that was broken down that uh, needed a part. We didn't have the part, but had a project going on where there was an engineer coming. I put it back together, trusting that it would work for the duration of the project we needed it for. I call that faith. My wife calls it stupidity. And uh, <laughs> it held the whole time. We did this project. We were there all day. And then I parked it. And then the moment I moved it next, the next morning, it fell back apart. So it was like just right. So uh, praise the Lord for uh, his faithfulness and my stupidity, but he is good. Um, and uh, we're just laughing and praising him for his faithfulness, even in the little things. Uh, we're going to give thanks. We're going to uh, review where we've been and know then where we're going as we're going to open the word in Romans chapter 10 this morning. And we'll give thanks together. Lord, thank you that again, as we come before you, that you've called us today to be people who trust you, to walk with you, to know that you are abiding with us. Thank you that again today you are grabbing hold of each and every one of us. You long to make us, mold us, and shape us into your likeness on this journey here on earth, that we might be bearers of your glory, that we might represent your kingship. Thank you that today, those citizens of heaven, we walk here on this earth, that people might know you and long to be with you and know you as we do. Thank you that today as we open your word again, we trust that you alone are speaking, guiding our hearts and minds. Not an academic conversation, but a seeking of spiritual truth written on our hearts. Thank you that your spirit today speaks loudly and clearly. And that as we listen, you might provide words to us of life everlasting in Jesus name. Amen. Well, as we pick up uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 10. And as I mentioned the week previous, there's a shift in the book of Romans as he's been discussing God and this gift of faith that he's provided. And as we are called to now be a living sacrifice unto God, laying down our lives daily, God, as we... Uh, look today at the word has called us into this walk this relationship with him and while we uh, being gentiles have been given this wonderful gift of faith it is no different from the gift uh, for the jew and yet this as paul writes in chapters uh, 9 10 and 11 we mentioned there's this shift to talk to not only those who as we read are jews spiritually but also those in heritage physically are Jews. And they have a special place before the Lord. Because they were, as we read last week, given the things of the law, the temple service. And they were God's people as a signpost to be a relationship uh, and what it meant to walk in a relationship with God. And as we looked last week, as we read Romans in chapter 9, we noted that God has us set on a track that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And in the midst of that journey, we note that we talked about the great potter and that God in his sovereignty has chosen. And he's chosen a few things. One, he's chosen that the lamp will never go out. And we're going to read, uh, read up on that as we get into chapter 11, exactly what that means and how that plays out. But we note that in God's sovereignty, notice as we've read before, even if every rock, uh, every mouth should be shut, even the rocks will cry out. That is, God is in the business of proclaiming his goodness and producing his glory. And even if every mouth were shut, the creation would cry forth. 
And yet even then, and we're going to read examples of this, that God is going to preserve for himself a faithful testimony so that on this earth, the lamp will never go out. That's why we are here, to proclaim that glory. And so that is true for the world. It is true in the nation of Israel. A lamp is burning. And uh, as we'll talk about that, I often uh, laugh with a, a friend who's, who's a Messianic Jew, and he'll often tell me stories and talking about the end times and what is to come. And he'll read a news article about a, a, a terrorist trying to throw a bomb into a car window uh, uh, of some uh, Israel minister or 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 elect official and having that bomb bounce off the window and, and fly back at them or blow up in some obscure place and you'll laugh and say ha the time isn't yet <laughs> right well, there are things that are to come things that are going to happen and yet in God's time God is ordaining these moments and we can trust this that today God will keep the lamp lit all creation is here to proclaim his name. He's also chosen this, that in his sovereignty, as we read, that he has chosen that, that the promise is found by faith. And so I want you to remember, we're talking about a group of people, and as he turns his gaze to the Israelites, and after last Sunday where I tried to give as much theological meanderings for everyone to disagree with slightly uh, and, and be troubled, uh, this morning we can look back and just see this, that, that as we look on, that in God's sovereignty you have a group of people looking as the Jewish nation, the people of God, saying, we are the people of God. And now Paul's saying, oh yeah, but God's given it to the Gentiles. And they're saying, not fair. <laughs> Look at what we've suffered. Look at how we grew up. Look how we had to wear funny clothes, cut our hair funny, wear hats, wear this, do this, eat this way. And now you're telling us they have the glory too. And he says, listen, God is sovereign. He's the potter. You're the clay. And this morning, as we look at that sovereignty, it was his choice that one, that the promise would be found by faith. And that's what we read in Romans 9 to summarize his argument. That was this. Remember verse 30 of Romans 9? What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. You see, Paul was reminding them that the Jews had missed something. Why? Because they sought righteousness as though it was their own righteousness by works. And the Gentiles had received it by faith. God chose a gift that would come by faith, not by works, not by lineage, not by birthright, not whether you were the eldest or the youngest. By example, Jacob and Esau, the older, would serve the younger. Why? Because God had chosen that it was not your birth order, but by faith that you received the promise. And then you might ask, well, surely if he chose, why not choose to to Take out the wicked, all that is opposite to God. And God said also in his sovereignty, he's chosen that though there may be vessels of wickedness, he's chosen to let them remain. Why? So that his glory might be seen all the more. Exemplified in Pharaoh, someone who is against God. And yet what? Chosen to keep on being there. Why? Exodus so that not only the Egyptians, but the whole world might know that he is the Lord. You see, God was in it for a reason. And from the beginning, as we read in Joshua, when he came upon that soldier and he said, are you for us or against us? What was the answer? Neither, for I am captain of the Lord's army. From the beginning, God is in it for his glory. And his glory is manifest, sometimes through the wicked, though deserving destruction, kept on for the purpose of proclaiming God's greatness. 
And at times, though the people of who were carried the name Israel thought they were the great people of God, given to those who seemed godless. Why? For the furthering of the glory of God. You see, today, God chooses his glory, his glory proclaimed. And this morning, as we read forward, this is what we need to remember as we look at Romans chapter 10. It says this, as we look at living before this God, who's chosen faith, and declaring his glory as the means to the promise and his purpose. Romans 10 verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He goes on and says this in Romans 10 verse 5. For Mo Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. For the word, it says, for what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. Now I want to stop there to note this. That he says, Moses writes that the man who practices righteousness, which is based on law, shall live by that righteousness. Any one of us who lives a life thinking, I can do it. I can achieve rightness or righteous standing before God. Proclaims that you will live by that, whatever standard you think you can attain. And God's made it very clear from the beginning that no matter how right or righteous we think we are, can we ever be righteous enough to fulfill his requirements or the demands for our sin? The answer is no. And he said it is here that we understand that by faith we achieve a righteousness that does not say who will descend or who will go up and get. Why? Because God's already placed it within our hearts. Now as we read, it says this. The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. And that is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, this is the crux of what we want to look at this morning. And as we look at this discussion going on between Jew and Greek and finding salvation by faith... He says these words that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. As we read this morning, we want to note something, and that is this, that today that our belief, and once again, as we've done before, we want to differentiate between simply the word belief and faith. That faith is the action word of belief. Because you can believe in God and yet lack faith. This is the problem with a group of people that as Paul's addressing in Romans 10 verse 2 says, I testify about them, the, the Israelites, they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. 
In James chapter 5 and verse 16, James writes this for us. He says, he says uh, listen, actually James 2 verse 19. Do you believe you do well? The demons believe also. What does that tell you this morning? Does Satan believe that Jesus is Lord of Lords? Yes, he knows. <laughs> he knows. And yet it tells us the demons also know and believe. And yet in James chapter 2, he reminds us that that in and of itself is not enough. The knowledge of God or the knowledge about God. Because the Israelites had it in full. And often that, if I'm honest again this morning, is often where my Christian walk stops and stays. The belief in God that he is there. That he is over all the earth. That he is Lord of all dominions. And yet, if I leave it there, what does it profit me? Today, if someone tells you of the great stock that's about to go boom. And, and, and today you have all knowledge that tomorrow $5 could turn into $5 million and yet you do nothing. You believe it, you know it. You have all the information and yet you do not take the step of faith but to put your $5 down. What does it profit you? Nothing. It, it, it's a step forward. And here, as Paul reminds us, is that there is this meeting place, a melding of the belief in the word of God. We have faith and we know in our heart that God is true. And yet then, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The confession is the outward action of what? An inward belief. That's faith. That's trust. That's putting your action in where your heart lies. And yet a great obstacle. And, and, and just what we're reading, Paul writes this to the Philippians. And I want you to note that in everything, he was... He was searching for this very thing. He says this, familiar verses, Philippians 2 and verse 4, although I myself, actually Philippians 3 verse 4, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Here's the key. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. You see, he understood this, and that was that he needed to count all things lost in view of the surpassing value, so that he might be found not having a righteousness of his own derived from the law. What have we just read in Romans 10? This is a group of people with a great zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Why? Chapter 10, verse 3, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. What got in the way? They're clinging to their own 
ideals of their own righteousness got in the way of seeing the fullness of the surpassing value of the power of the resurrection and fellowship with God. Their knowledge of God did not find its way into the action of trusting him. But remember, we got into these verses in the context of what? We're going to read in chapter 12. We are a living sacrifice, suffering. Because the moment your belief meets action and you understand that faith is the key to righteousness, all of a sudden, read the list that Paul just said. I've spent my life dedicated, circumcised the eighth day, nation of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, zeal, persecutor of the church, righteousness, blameless, as to the law. Here's what he has to do. Think about the effort that that's taken. The time, the investment, the money. Here's what Paul needs to do. I count it all loss. It's nothing. No value and no benefit. And this morning, if there's a, a crisis of faith, as it were, it may be found in the fact that today, you may look back at your lineage, your heritage, your upbringing, at the Christian principles you were brought up by, and you may have spent time at Awana memorizing Bible verses. You may have spent time praying, going to studies, giving, sacrificing. You may have spent time doing all of these things and this morning being confronted with the fact that it has nothing to do with making you righteous today. That today, those actions didn't get you any farther down the road if they weren't firmly rooted in faith. They may seem good in of themselves, but in and of themselves couldn't do it. And today God is leading us down a road in which we need to look back at often what is our hard work for God and see the fact that without God, it profits us nothing. This was Israel. They spent their whole time with great zeal for God and yet missing God in the process. And again, if we can come down and look now and define our Christian walk, our Christian lives, and if they can be defined by my education, my background, my upbringing, my church denomination, my gift, my ability, uh, my voice, <laughs> my effort, anything. We may know about God, but we may still have yet missed God in the midst of it. Because those things are to be an outworking from a relationship with God, not something to be done for him. Israel had missed it. And as we saw a beautiful picture of baptism today, it's that act Again, baptism, baptismo. Remember the same word used to make huh, the dyeing of a cloth. You baptized a white cloth in a dye so that it was a different color. It intrinsically changed. I've told you previous, baptismo, same word for making pickles. You baptized the cucumbers in vinegar and baptismo. They came out what? <laughs> Not cucumbers, but pickles intrinsically different now much longer lasting and better tasting right <laughs> eternal life in the cucumber realm right baptismo there it was they were baptized baptism was that outward declaration of what an inward change of heart Needed for salvation? No, you were already saved. That's why again and again, as we've talked about circumcision in the book of Romans, God says, even in Deuteronomy, circumcise your hearts before me today. It wasn't the physical act that saved them. The act was an outward expression of what? A change of heart. 
And yet, when we have a change of heart, it doesn't lessen the act. Because today, he's called us to the act of baptism. And we can say, in my head, really, you want to take a grown person and make them have a bath in public in front of a bunch of people? Really? There's a sense of humbling ourselves. And what? In obedience, proclaiming outwardly what's gone on inwardly. And this is it. There is great power found today in confessing, which often today I'm going to suggest in my truly inward, introvert, Mennonite upbringing, <laughs> I've found that, that there are times in which my spiritual walk has become, and perhaps I've grown too comfortable at having an introverted walk. When today God's called us to, to an extroverted faith. That is, that today we're called to proclaim, to confess. And, and there's power to be found there. Uh, when we speak, the, the words, and, and I even think to the Lord's actions. Look back to the book of Genesis. God is big enough that if he so thought, it would come into being. And yet, remember Genesis 1, what does it say? And he said what? Let there be light. And there was light. He spoke and it came into being. He didn't just acknowledge it in mind, he acknowledged it in voice. And I think sometimes I prefer to acknowledge in here what I want to keep in here. It's safer there. I think of a story in which and this challenges me every time I think about it. Uh, I had the privilege of traveling in India for a, a month or so, uh, spending time uh, teaching and sharing and meeting and visiting uh, many people uh, there. And, and it was a great time. And it was there that I heard a story uh, of a great gathering. And people were coming to an evangelistic meeting in the hundreds, if not thousands. And as they were, the storm clouds rolled in. And as those clouds rolled in and threatened rain, people started leaving. And, and, and in that moment, uh, they said, no, this isn't right. This is God's meeting. This is God time. And they began praying. Or at least one began praying. As one stood up in the microphone and said this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you clouds to go away. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a moment where I go breathless. <laughs> because here's why. What, what's, the, what's the moment? What if? What's the what if? What if it didn't happen? Yeah. You see, and I've already lost. <laughs> you see, I'm, see, I'm not the right one to stand there because I already lost. Because now, what is it? Is it a faith act or What? No, because my fear outweighs my faith. And here's, here's, the, here's the conundrum. My fear outweighs my faith. And my fear is this. If it doesn't happen and I say Jesus' name, now what? God's not glorified, but what? Mocked. And yet, think of it this way. If I pray in the quietness of my heart and the clouds are removed... How, who has the greater glory for God? Do you see what I'm saying? There's greater glory found in what? The confession of faith. Why? Because all are welcome to what? See it and partake in it. Whereas the private prayer says what? God take the clouds away. Okay. I'm going to remove them. And it's between me and God. Whereas in my confession, what happens? I've welcomed everyone into the conversation of faith. You are all now watching a theater of faith. And the eyes are, are no longer on me, but on who? God. This reminds me of Kings 18, where Elijah is standing on Mount Carmel. Remember this? And he's taunting the prophets of Baal to light their sacrifice on fire and he's saying sing louder maybe they're asleep 
Maybe they're away. Call, sing. And they're cutting themselves. And he's taunting them. And then when it's his turn, in, in 1 Kings 18, it's his turn. He says, okay, build me an altar for the Lord. And then dig a trench around it. And remember, he had already been praying that there would be no rain for a number of years. And he says this. He says, listen, now I want you to go and get jars of water and pour water on it. And I want you to do it again. They're on a mountain. There's a drought going on. Cattle are dying for a lack of water. And he's finding water to pour on a sacrifice that he wants God to light on fire. Is he confident? Just slightly. Just slightly. In Kings, he goes on and he prays to the Lord. And he says, and I'll, I'll read it for you in his prayer. He says this. At that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. He was praying what? It wasn't just for him to know that God was the God of Israel and that he was a servant of God. It was for who to know? Let all know. You see, he was confidently confessing his faith. And so often today, I believe in my heart, but I don't let that belief affect my word and deed. Often it is my fear that outweighs my faith. You know where else it weighs? It, it tells us in James chapter 5 and verse 16. Confess your sins to one another. That today God, a great part of not only forgiveness, but of moving forward in, in the power of God's deliverance is about confession. And isn't that it? It's easy to confess to God in the quietness of my heart, here's what's difficult, to confess to others. 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins to one another and you will be saved. You see, because I'm vulnerable and the moment I tell you my weakness, my failure, my shortcomings, what do I see coming? Judgment, Hatred, <laughs> rejection. But what I've also done in my fear of those consequences, physical, I've robbed everyone the ability to join in the theater of God's glory in seeing transformation physical. Because if I can't confess to you my lying ways, you'll never see God's glory and that he's powerful enough to make me a man of truth. If I'm not bold enough to believe God and confess uh, my stinginess, he, you'll never get a chance to see that God's big enough to make the stingy generous. If I'm not, if I'm not bold enough in faith to trust God, to tell you about my weakness, you'll never see God's strength. You see, today, true deliverance is found not just in belief, but in what? The action of confession. Both before God and the watching world. But to confess takes what? Faith. Because you have to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. You know, I remember a, a story of a man who sat down at a men's retreat. And where all the men were walking and talking and sharing, he stood up. And, and, and uh, this is relayed to me by a friend, but it's always stuck out to me. That one man stood up. And said this. He grabbed a microphone and just said, Hey everybody, this is a great retreat, but I just want you all to know, if there's any one of you in this room today, and we're going to be here all weekend, if there's anyone in this room today that struggled with 
Pornography? Come and talk to me. I, I know all about that struggle. If there's anyone who struggles with adultery, I've had a hard life with a divided marriage. I know about that struggle. Come and talk to me. If there's anyone who struggled with failure, I've lost everything I've had <laughs> twice. Come and talk to me. Do you know what? If there's anyone who struggles, and he went on, and the list went on, and he said, if any of you struggle in any of these areas, you know what? I'll be sitting right here all weekend. Do you think that man was ever alone all weekend? No. Do you know why? People did not reject him because of hearing of his weakness. Do you know why? We are all failures. <laughs> we are all weak, aren't we? Did they look the less? No, in fact, it drew them in. Why? Because they identified with someone who was seeking God and seeking God's deliverance in the midst of difficulty. That's the truth. That's the truth that fights the fear that often overrides our faith. That today, confession is the way to healing, not hiding. God forgives, but often we, we, we miss the purpose and the power of God by escaping the allowing of speaking what God is. And if there's anything I've come to learn in my quiet Mennonite ways, where many are out loud, like my friend, uh, who's louder than life, hands up, jumping up and down, me, pockets in, quiet, deep down, right, don't speak, eyes closed. Learning this. I don't have to be that, and yet this. There's great power found in in confession, bringing a voice to what God's doing inside, speaking out what lies in. And today, practicing confession, huge. It's as Paul writes, how many times do we read? Chief sinner am I, right? Murderer, slanderer, persecutor of the church. Did Paul ever try to paint a rosy picture of his past? No, because he knew in that past, people saw the greatness of a God who had delivered him. And it was in confessing that past that he would find that power. Today, do we confess not only who we are, but who God is? Today, I am a child of God. Today, in the face of sin, I confess that through Jesus, I can overcome. Today, though sin may seem so strong, today, in Jesus' name, the chains of that sin have been broken. I am free. Today, do you know in your heart and if you come to a place where you're ready to proclaim with your voice, Jesus is Lord. And as we are witnesses of that glory, God will be witness to his power. Today we're called to be speakers of truth and know this, that whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Today I trust that we will call on the name of the Lord in that great salvation that he's offered. Now there's more to read in Romans chapter 10. And I'm going to read it, and, and in some ways, we're going to caption a thought here that's going to lead us into our time together next week. But it says this. Listen to Romans 10 and verse 14. But how will they call on him who they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? 
And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Now, I want to stop there because, again, these are verses so often taken out of context, aren't they? These are the ones read on Missionary Sunday when we want to uh, feel guilty about not giving, not going. Uh, but, but it's all out of context. Why? Number one, these are verses in regards to Israel. Number one. And the question is, how then will they call on this Jesus who we find by faith if they've not believed? And how will they believe in him if they've not heard about him? Right? Here's the question. They're saying, hey God, we want this, but we never knew. And how will they preach unless they're sent? Uh, here's the answer. Romans 10, 18. And this is how Paul again asks a question, answers it. Asks a question, answers it. But I surely say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Indeed they have. He goes on and says this. Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. But I say surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Here's what he's saying. How could Israel believe if they didn't know? How could they know if they hadn't heard? Here's Paul. But they did hear. But they did know. Why? Why? Because he told them. And all day long, Romans 10, 21, he says for Israel, all day long I have stretched out my hand to a disobedient, obstinate people. Here's our end question today. Today, we can never say those words, I didn't know. From Romans 1, we've been reading about a God who's made it painfully clear displaying his glory, not hide and seek, but known in all that he's made. And today, all day long, stretching out his hand to a people who knew him by name and yet refused to know him by faith. Knew him by ritual and cultural routine and yet didn't let it affect their outward confession. Today, as God places his finger on each one of our hearts, what's he calling us to confess today? What's he calling us to live out that we've known that lies deep within? What I'd like to do is pause for a moment of prayer and we'll end this way before uh, Mary Charlotte's going to come and lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving because I think in any prayer of confession should always be followed with a prayer of true thanksgiving for who God is in the midst of it. And yet today as we look to God's word we want to take the time and it's often as I've said before easy to allow our prayers to be filled with the physical. Things we want fixed, like my excavator. Things we need healed, like my excavator. Things we want done, right? Things that we want to see. And yet often, and maybe it's if you're like me, because my fear overrides my faith, we fall short of allowing true confession to fill our prayers. And, and whether God is calling you today to confess within or on the out, 
let's just take a time and pray together. And, and whether it's in one word, one sentence, ten words, or ten sentences, you feel God saying, declare, confess. Then together as a body. And you know what I love about this church? I sense a church that is not judgmental. In a, in a place where I've been to churches that seem like everyone is trying to put on an air of perfection, I look out here and I don't see perfection at all. And that was my judgment. I'm joking. I'm joking. Joking. <laughs> I see a lot of failure out there today. I see a lot of failure. I'm going to be honest with you. But you know what? We are all weak. We have all failed. We are all fallen. And today we can proclaim that. Knowing that in proclaiming it, we find power. Power over Satan's lies, over, over the, the walking in the shadows, of trying to put on a personification of Christian perfection that has nothing to do with the righteousness of faith. And we find the power to defeat the evil one. Let's pray. And if you feel so led, lead out. If you don't, pray quietly within. And at the end, after a time, I'll close. Because it is not time always to confess to all people. It, yet sometimes it's right to confess to one or two as God has provided. Um, it, it's not a, a time where we feel the need to grandstand our sin or the sin of others. Confession can simply be also confessing who he is. Lord of our lives in areas where perhaps we haven't let him be Lord. But let's pray. And as you feel so led, without judgment, we can come before God, acknowledge who we are and who he is. I'll close at the end, and then we'll lead into some praying afterwards of also thanksgiving. Let's pray.